Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. Today's video is all about Panama hats. I discuss the shapes, what to buy, what not to buy, how it got its name, how it's made, and what to pay attention to, and anything else you want to know about this wonderful summer hat. <laughs> What is a Panama hat? Basically, it is a white summer hat that is woven from the straw of the Toquilla palm. Even though it's called Panama hat, it's originally made in Ecuador and it has never been made in Panama. In Ecuador, it's better known as the sombrero de paya Toquilla, which means as much as straw hat. Panama hats have been woven in Ecuador since the 17th century and have been imported since the 19th century to Europe, the Americas and Asia. So how did the Panama hat got its name? During the 1834 gold rush in Canada, when miners went from South America to Canada, they saw those hats in Panama and so they got their name. On top of that, Theodore Roosevelt popularized the hat style and even cemented the Panama name when he was wearing one, observing the Panama Canal and of course being photographed. So how is a Panama made? Basically, you take the core fibers of the toquilla plant, which are also known as cogollos. The cogollos are the hearts of the palm tree and they're carefully separated by hand and then briefly boiled. Since they're wet, they have to be sun-dried or air-dried and once that's done, the fiber is bleached with sulfur smoke to give it the original Panama light color. Sometimes you can also find uncolored heads, but they have a much more yellow appearance. To get really fine heads, the palm tree fibers are split into even finer straw fibers. The weaving of a Panama head begins at the center of the crown. Once the crown is large enough, it's put in a dry pot and woven on top of a head block at about waist height. Once the weave extends past the sides of the head block, the weaver adds additional blocks on top and pulls down the weave so it stays in place and it gets that head shape. The entire process is physically quite tiring and depending on how fine your head is, it can take anywhere from a few weeks up to several months to create one hat. Once the weaver gets to the edge of the brim, it's typically handed off to other artisans who finish the hat. Traditionally, a Panama hat has a loose back weave, which is much more elegant than a cut and sewn edge. So whenever you want a quality hat, look for that edge because it's, if it's back woven, it's of a much higher quality than if it's cut and sewn. Typically, you have one person who starts the loose back weave, a second one that tightens it, and the third one cuts off the loose straw so it has a polished, nice finish. If you have a very fine head, they keep that excess straw and use it to maybe make repairs later on. In the next step, the heads are washed and bleached with sulfur to make them softer and more suitable to wear as a wonderful summer hat. Subsequently, the heads are blocked or either brought to the US to head blockers who then get the head the right shape. In my experience, the hats that come directly out of Ecuador usually have a very small range of different styles and shapes and they're very limited. Because of that, quality Panama hats are usually brought raw at this stage to the US or to other countries where they're then blocked by an experienced hat blocker who can get exactly the shape the customer demands. Traditionally, every Panama hat was woven by hand, but due to the high demand, most hats these days are machine woven. Now that you know how a Panama hat is made, let's discuss the quality hallmarks. Basically, it comes down to straw and weave. The finer the straw, the more equal all the fibers are, and the more evenly they're colored, the higher the quality of the hat. Just take a look of these two hats and you can clearly see the color differences. This one is more valuable than that one. When it comes to the weave, a finer, denser weave that's more regular is more desirable than a looser, wider weave that's more irregular. Traditionally, hats are categorized in Monte Cristi Fino or Monte Cristi Superfino. However, those terms are not protected and so it pays to actually count the weaves per square inch to get a good idea of what you're buying in terms of quality. The highest quality hats in the market have about 2,000 to 4,000 weaves or knots per square inch. That's an extremely high number and it can take 8 to 12 months for those hats to be completed. Of course, these hats are very rare and there are not many people who can weave them anymore. One of them is Simon Espinat, who I think exclusively now weaves for one weaver, one store in the world, so you can really only get it from him. 
And to my knowledge, he's the best weaver alive today. In the old days, there was a specific grading system that everybody would abide by. However, today, that's not really the case anymore. And so rather than looking at the old way to do it, it pays to simply count the diamond points. In Ecuador, these diamond points are called carreras. You should always measure them one inch in from the brim or two and a half centimeters because that gives you an accurate count. Sometimes people count them in the middle or in the top of the crown. However, that's wrong because it usually has a higher density and it throws off the numbers. Another Panama head grading criterion is sometimes the vueltas, which are the concentric circles that you can see on the brim when you hold it against the sun or a strong light source. Here you can see a few circles and the more you have, the more desirable it is, the higher the quality. Personally, I think it's easiest to look at a hat and look at the evenness in the color, the evenness and fineness of the straw and the weave, and the knots or the weaves per square inch. So a decently Monte Cristi Superfino will probably run you around $300 to $500 or $600, depending on the quality of the straw, the color, the weave, and the final look. The most expensive Panama hats in the world can fetch anywhere from $20,000 to $30,000. Entry-level hats can be had very inexpensively, starting at $20 all the way up to $100, depending on the finishing, the brand, the look, the headband, and the quality of the straw. In terms of styles, probably the most popular one is the fedora style. And if you want to learn more about the fedora hat, please check out this in-depth guide here. The second style is the Optimo style, which is distinctly British, and it's characterized by a slight dent through the middle of the crown. The third most popular style is the planter style, which has a white brim, which protects you more from the sun, and a molded crown. The fourth style is the golf Panama hat, which oftentimes features an open weave. Because it's so open, you get a better airflow, especially in our breezy conditions. So where should you buy quality Panama hats? Please check the guide on our website here, where you can find the best hats for your money in different price categories. So what should you pay attention to when you buy a Panama head? First, verify that it's a handmade head and the original origin of the head, which can be quite tricky, but if you go with a reputable header or head store, you'll know they come from Ecuador. Ideally, you should buy for quality and longevity, not for price. One thing that's often underestimated is the shape of the Panama head. The head to your right is the typical Panama shape that you find all over the place. No matter if your head is $1,000 or $100, it'll always look like that. The one on your left is a vintage head shape, and it has a taller, higher crown, and in my opinion, a much more attractive curved shape. The problem is, if you get a head like this one on the right, and the brim has a certain size and the crown has a certain size, you cannot make it just into this shape. You need a head that actually has the crown height. So pay attention to that, because even if you have a really finely woven head, it won't make you look as dapper as a head that's maybe of a lower quality, but has a superb shape. Don't be discouraged by the headbands and the ribbons. Most of them are black and come in very boring shapes, but it's very easy to take them off and have unusual colors in different shapes added for a very low price. For example, for five bucks, I got a green headband in the shape I wanted, in the size I wanted. It's actually a vintage band, and I much prefer it to the standard conformist black band that you see everywhere. Traditional fedora style Panama hats usually feature a leather sweatband, which in my opinion is not ideal because it's a hat you wear during warmer seasons, and as such, with a leather, you're more prone to sweating. In my case, that leads to zits on my forehead, and to prevent that, I either opt for a cloth headband or I go completely without one. When you buy hats sometimes, you find those hat boxes and they're usually more for decorative purposes. And traditionally, sometimes it was a hallmark to show that a hat was so soft that you could roll it and put it in there. But if you have a nicely blocked hat, don't roll it up and put it in those boxes because you'll destroy the hat. One is the standard Panama hat in a nice even color. The weave is nice and dense, but the straw is not super fine. However, it's back woven and it has a fabric sweatband. Golf style with air holes, which is particularly nice when you're exercising and play golf or do other things in the summer. And it comes with a nice dark tobacco brown sweatband, which I think looks much better than a black one. Last but not least, they sent me this wonderful Monte Cristi Superfino, which has a very nice and dense weave 
a beautifully backwoven brim. Personally, I prefer different colored ones. It takes sometimes six months to make these hats. Because of that, it doesn't make sense to stock them. And so they rather list individual hats so you can see the exact weave count, you can see the color, you can see the shape, and everything there is to that particular one Monte Cristi. Once it's sold, it's gone. Can you wear a Panama hat? Basically all the time. I'm wearing it here with a seersucker suit. However, you can go with a simple pair of swim trunks, maybe with just a polo shirt, just a shirt, because the main purpose is to keep your head out of the sun, and it's a summer hat, and because of that, you can really wear it with everything in your wardrobe. It's probably the most versatile hat you'll ever own. So what about Panama etiquette? When should you not wear a Panama hat? Just like we outlined in our fedora hat guide, you should not wear a hat when you are in places of worship or in people's homes. Unless, of course, it's a public building like a railway station, then you can keep it on. Generally, it's not a great idea to wear a hat and sunglasses. However, with a Panama hat, it's slightly different because you wear it when it's really bright outside. And if even the wide brim can't protect your face, simply go with sunglasses. Even Prince Charles does it. If you want to get in today's video, I'm wearing, of course, a Panama hat, which is a Monte Cristo Superfino with a green headband. Then I'm having a white, super thin, light dress shirt, which is very breathable. And it's from Siniscalchi in Milan. It's paired with a seersucker suit, single-breasted, three-button from Polo Ralph Lauren. It has cuffs or turnips on the pants, which helps to pull down the pants so they hang a little more nicely. It's made out of 100% cotton, no edit polyester or nylon, and it has the traditional crinkle seersucker cut. And if you want to learn more about this material, please check out our seersucker guide on the website here. I'm pairing it with a Cri de la Soie silk knit tie from Fort Belvedere that is model in its appearance and it's perfect for summer. I'm pairing it with a shinier silk pocket square in orange from Printed English Silk also from Fort Belvedere, which you can find in our shop here. For the socks, I added a dash of color and went with solid blue ones with a clock pattern, which are also from Fort Belvedere. You could alternatively go with all white socks, especially if you wear white buckskin shoes the way I do it, which are from Shoe Passion, and I'm combining them with green shoelaces from Fort Belvedere to just break up that look and add a little more contrast. As you might notice, I'm wearing barrel cuffs, not cufflinks, because it's warm in the summer and double cuffs make you feel hotter. Instead of the cufflinks, I'm going with a pinky ring that is blue that picks up the colors of the seersucker suit. As you can see, the lapels are quite slim, so a large boutonniere would not be in order. However, a small one, such like a delphinium or another small flower, would look perfect on it. If you enjoyed this video, Make sure to subscribe to our channel and sign up to our newsletter so stuff like this comes right to your inbox.